Professor Galbraith, would you say something about the differences between, uh, or, or in your concept of finance capital, between the founding of modern technology firms, the Silicon Valley phenomenon, versus the expansion of Wall Street capital and right. what each contributes to uh, this escalation in uh, concentrated wealth? Oh, I, well, I think that compared to what happened in uh, the middle 2000s in mortgage finance, what happened with Silicon Valley in the late 1990s was uh, comparatively honest. <laughs> the, uh, it, it's clear that uh, standards fell even from the uh, relatively elastic uh, business plans of web van and uh, other remarkable <laughs> accomplishments. Uh, the uh, idea that you could order ice cream over the internet, for example, and that it would still be frozen when it arrived was a, a very interesting technical problem, which even electronics could not solve. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, uh, but that was, as I say, relatively benign compared to what happened uh, in the real estate sector, where what one had effectively was deregulation followed by deep supervision, followed by the taking over of the entire sector uh, by massively crooked elements. Uh, and the, the, uh, uh, the, the story I always tell, which I think reveals both the nature of the firm, of the firms and the, their links to the government, is that told by Bethany McLean and Joseph Nocera in All the Devils Are Here of the great company AmeriQuest, uh, which they tell uh, was a mortgage origination company that increased the effectiveness of its loan officers by feeding them crystal methamphetamine. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the, the, the second point of that story of that is that the chief executive officer of AmeriQuest, Roland Arnau, uh, as you no doubt know, ended his career in the post of United States ambassador to the Netherlands, appointed by the president with the advice and consent of the Senate. So if you think there's any further uh, to fall, I, I think it really does challenge your imagination. Uh, Alice, I want to thank you both uh, for sharing, sharing with us. I, I would uh, have one question for each of you. Uh, and Angus, it was a very provocative statement. I'm hoping if I heard you correctly, you could elaborate more. Did I hear you say foreign aid might have contributed to inequality? And, and be really interested uh, to hear a little bit more about that. And um, a potentially, hopefully, a provocative question on really this robust look at global uh, macro uh, inequality, income inequality. So what? In the sense that it seems in um, up t uh, downturns and upturns, the inequality tends to accelerate, if I understood that correctly. And what, what might we glean from your research at these uh, macro trends on inequality? What, what are the implications for policy or okay. otherwise? So uh, let me say a few words about the aid, though. Um, it's a long argument, and my book only costs $9.92 on Kindle today. <laughs> uh, it's like $9.94 yesterday or something. And, and you know, I, I have the horrible feeling that someone out there is doing experiments with my book all the time. So. Um, <laughs> But the, the thrust of my argument is, is just that, um, you know, what is missing in a lot of poor countries is any sort of contract between the government and the people, whereby people agree to pay taxes and the government in return provides the government services for it. Um, you know, we in this country a few months ago had a partial government shutdown. Um, but it was only partial and it was carefully designed to be the part of the government that you know, don't really affect our daily lives. But if you imagine what it would be like in the US if the police force went away, if local government, if um, state government, and if federal governments all closed down, our lives would become absolutely unlivable. And that's a pretty fair description of what it's like to be in many poor countries. I mean, to be in a country where the police prey on people. Um, they don't try to protect them, for example. So. 
what aid does in countries where aid is almost 100% of government revenues is it relieves the government of any need to form any sort of contract with the people. And at worst, it forms a sort of codependency between us and this awful government that we're in part responsible for constructing and at least maintaining in power, in which we for our ends and they for their ends um, basically form an alliance to exploit their own people. Um, and this makes them rich and privileged at the expense of their people, and it stops their country from growing, which widens the gap between us and them. So notice the limits on this argument. I mean, this is an argument about flows of money going into the countries, not an argument about, you know, people have said to me, if I were to give you $10 billion to be spent on the poor of the world, would you burn it? And I say, well, no, what I'd do is go down to Washington, D.C., you know, get on the red line, go out to Bethesda, and I'd start a new National Institute of Health that works on malaria and tuberculosis and other neglected diseases, for instance. What I tell my students who come to me and say, you know, we're really dedicated to doing something about world poverty. You know, should I go to Dakar or should I go to Dhaka? And I say, you should go to Washington, D.C., where you can do the most good by stopping what we're doing to them, not to go to the countries themselves. A question about you know, what does it all mean? I am hesitant to ascribe good or evil to the movement of a particular number. I think that should be done very carefully. And I think it, you run the risk of uh, spending your time focused on a number which may be an artifact of something quite different from what you imagined uh, and may be quite remote from the things that concern most people. Right? After all, in the great collapse that we've experienced, uh, most people in the United States did not move to a position of starvation. What they did, what happened to them was they lost their, their asset position, their 401ks, they lost the value of their homes. They, in many cases, they lost employment. Uh, they found their futures being destabilized in ways which only show up to a little degree in the income statistics. So one then has to ask, well, okay, what is it the income statistics are showing? Uh, the metaphor I think I find most useful here, uh, and to maybe tread a little bit on the terrain of someone who knows a great deal more about health than I do, is blood pressure. Uh, that is to say, in these numbers, there's a healthy range, and you can be within that healthy range and you're basically all right, although, generally speaking, lower is better. The numbers can be too low. I pointed briefly to the case of the German Democratic Republic. Uh, if the number gets to zero, you find that basically in the morgue. Right? Uh, and on the other side of the, of, the, of the spectrum, when the number is rising, you're heading for trouble. It's not necessarily symptomatic. It might be something that, a process that you quite enjoy. But you're heading for trouble. And that trouble will emerge in the form of a crisis after which you may be seriously impaired. And I think that's the situation that we face. Actually, we faced it in 2000, and again, even more seriously, the second heart attack, if you like, in 2007, where, from which I, I think the reason that we have not gone back to the previously normal economic trend and will not is that we have been seriously impaired. And we have to deal with the problem of the structure of the financial sector and a number of other issues that reflect the way in which the world has changed and which our ability to cope with it has changed. Thanks. Uh, I wondered uh, if you have any thoughts about Thomas Piketty's book. Uh, it seemed to me, it was particularly uh, for Professor Galbraith, that he 
my impression from having just read it is that he assumes that most of the changes in inequality in the 20th century came from changes in the capital share rather than changes within the wage structure. And you, you have focused just on changes within the wage structure. Do you, is this a different picture or are you picking up a different kind of inequality? Um, well, I, I have a 4,000 word review of Piketty's book in Descent, uh, which appeared last week. Uh, so I have a great many things I could say about the book. Uh, in, on, on the point you just raised, I think for the countries he's looking at, he's almost surely right that the major changes are changes in uh, capital-based incomes, not necessarily stock mar uh, options and capital gains, but also incomes paid out of revenue that comes from investors rather than from customers, if you like, so the, uh, the proceeds of IPOs and so forth, uh, and, and financial rents. Uh, I think that much is perfectly correct. He's pointing to something which uh, I have also been saying for a long time. Our data in this area and the literature uh, uh, which I was showing you, that we were comparing ourselves to, uh, is over a much wider range of countries. And I think that capital market share uh, in most countries is much smaller than it is in the UK, the US, and France, which, is, which are a very large part of what Thomas P uh, Piketty is, has, has, has actually focused on. And not surprisingly, it's you, you, you shine the flashlight where the tax data are most comprehensive and longest lasting. But I mean, these very high earned incomes are rising almost everywhere, though um, I agree with what Jamie said about the countries involved. I mean, I, I think, I mean, a lot of these very high incomes are officially classified as wages, yes. right? Because they're, um, you know, if you get paid $30 million as a CEO, that's wage earnings. That's the way we classify them. Um, but the, the, we were talking about this over lunch. I mean, I, one of the things I got from that analysis was the sense that, you know, much of the debate in the United States has been about very high incomes, but those very high incomes are going to turn into enormous hordes of wealth um, over time. And, you know, that's when you get back to the Gilded Age sort of idea, because there are lots of these guys on Wall Street who's you know, net worth is very large after a year or two salary, but it's not like J.P. Morgan was, you know, 100 years ago, but it soon will be. And then you've seen nothing yet. And I think those enormous hordes are likely to be very worrying for our future. And if I could just say a word on that, it, it seems to me that we already have a tested solution for this problem. I don't find it particularly problematic if someone in a relatively honest business accumulates a vast hoard on the basis of technical transformation, or competitive energy. It doesn't trouble me very much. But the kids? What business do they have getting fixed for life or becoming second generation oligarchs or third generation presidents from that original hoard. That's a problem. What's been the American approach to this? Estate taxation. Estate taxation with the proviso that if you give the stuff away before the Grim Reaper and the tax man gets it, then you know, it's free and clear in the hands of whatever institution you choose to give it to. And we have all around us the fruits of that system, which by and large does not exist in other parts of the world. Right? And I think it is, in fact, something which has been eroded and needs to be rebuilt. And the message basically should be, yeah, enjoy it while it lasts. But be aware that if your airplane goes down before you've given it away, it's going to disappear into the maw of the government. And we'll get another generation of great universities and hospitals and museums and theaters and all kinds of activities out of that. And we will have much higher employment than we would otherwise have. And that's what we should be aiming for. Uh, thank you. I wanted to uh, call Angus' uh, attention to uh, the comment regarding uh, the impact of uh, large financial outlays into uh, developing countries. I uh, wanted to find out if you could uh, 
perhaps considered uh, the reason why it hasn't really uh, helped is because um, 80 to 90 percent of those financial outlays go back to the, uh, the country that has actually decided to help the developing country. And uh, in addition, uh, the fact that uh, there hasn't been a lot of cooperation between, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the, uh, the host country and uh, the donor country about uh, the actual projects that are going on uh, in, 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 in the host country. So if you could respond to that, please. Uh, but I mean, that's the nature of the beast. I mean, the, um, you know, the fact that so much of that money has to be spent here just tells you that that money is not for, it's for us, not for them. I mean, to me, this is a form of neocolonialism. I mean, we're pretending to help them while actually paying off our domestic constituents. And um, even in Britain or in European countries, in Britain now it's illegal for foreign aid to be spent in Britain. So none of that money is spent in Britain. But that doesn't stop the politicians. It didn't stop Tony Blair pumping money into Kenya um, during the election before last in order to whitewash himself with his own people for the war in Iraq even when the ambassador in Kenya is sending him frantic cables saying this money is being used to kill people, intimidate people, and steal the election. And Tony Blair just fired the ambassador. So this is what I mean when I talk about a codependency between a really bad government there and a really bad government here in which you know they're doing each other favors, but those favors are not supposed to reach the people. That's not what it's about. And the coordination is really hard because um, you could do things if it was just you and them, but when there's a bunch of other donors who have different objectives from you, and then, my God, if you even arrange it with the French and the Germans, the Chinese will come in, you know, and uh, this is not. And I think thinking that you can fix that is just the wrong way of thinking about this problem. I mean, you're looking at a pathology, not a broken something that's good. Yep. Oh, can I up? Sure. Okay, so, uh, but how do you get there, right? Because <clears throat> you don't get there. Stop. You no, know, but stop you stop already. Uh, but, no, no. I mean, yeah. how do you? Uh, okay, let's be practical. Sorry, I'm one of the practical. I'm, <laughs> I'm a practical person. How, how do you? I mean, seriously, how do you get get it all stopped in one day? No, no one's stopping in one day. You write books. You go <clears throat> give talks. You say things like this, and you persuade people. And hopefully the right people got there. I mean, I got called up two days ago by David Cameron's development advisor. You know, so it works. It takes a long time. But I think things are really changing. I think the US is actually protected from what's happening in a lot of Europe because most Americans think foreign aid is useless and that it's all going down a rat hole. Americans don't really believe in foreign aid. They also, it's true. They do believe that way more is spent on it than is actually being spent on it. And they think it should be reduced to a number that's very much larger than it actually is. So actually, <laughs> inferring from that what people actually think is no easy matter. But in Europe, it's very hard because if um, politicians pull back on it, they get pilloried. And it's very interesting. If you look at the austerity program in Britain, for instance, from which they're all suffering these days, the, the one agency that was ring-fenced and protected from the, the cuts was the development AG, agency, was DFID. And I like to joke, and when I talk about this in Britain, I say the point of that was to make sure that the Africans suffered alongside <laughs> um, the Brits. So I'm very cynical about this, but I think if you come up with a reasoned argument and go on pushing it, people listen. Mm -hmm. And so I've not been disappointed in that. Can I ask one more question? Sure. Uh, uh, okay, so you have your $10 billion and you spent it on your National Health Institute. You're not allowed to spend the next $10 billion on that. So what would you spend it on? I would spend it on trying to do something about the arms trade, for instance. That would cost a lot more. There's one who's been up there for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, this one is a little bit off the topic. Thank you both for the uh, the great talks. But uh, early on in your talk, uh, Angus, you uh, raised the issue that you thought the increase in foreign-born economists in the U.S. over the last 20 years is changing. But you didn't say how. Okay. <laughs> in what direction do you see that changing? Well, for one thing, it's just got a lot more interesting. Um, and I mean, we I've not really seriously studied this, but I, I think of the archetypal economist in America 40 years ago as having being a farm boy from Nebraska or Montana. Um, southern of Ontario, Alton, actually. Or, or Southern Ontario, <laughs> but yeah, no, there's that too. But we're, with all the, the sort of traditions of the frontier sort of idea, and that, that's an environment in which free market capitalism is very much the way people think. Um, I, I think that the Europeans come from very, very different traditions, and they're very mixed. Um, some of them on the right, some of them on the left. And I think a lot of the most interesting work, um, which you might agree with or not agree with, I mean, I don't think it's uniform at all, is, is coming from foreign-born um, economists. I mean, like, you know, um, Raghur Rajan, who's now gone to be um, governor of the Central Bank of India, um, wrote a whole bunch of really interesting stuff. He's written with Zingales on a capitalism for the people, it's sort of, you know, people-based um, capitalism. Darren Asimoglu, of course, is Turkish. You know, I mean, there people are coming at this. Esther Duflo is a French Huguenot. I mean, there's just a very, very wide range of opinions that just did not used to be there. I think it would be still better if there were major centers of world economics outside of the top schools in the United States, um, which there used to be and which don't really exist to the same extent anymore. So maybe Piketty and Aguillon and Tirol will do some more of that in France, for instance. Um, but it would be good if that happened, and it might. There were a couple of people up there who have been waiting a long time. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, there, there seems to be some uncertainty, uh, at least in my mind, as to how much uh, revenue would be uh, gained as a result of a, uh, a higher tax bracket on the uh, top 5% of income or top 1% of income. And, uh, and, and I was wondering whether uh, you could comment on uh, whether there is, in fact, that uncertainty, and if so, why? Uh, for example, uh, I was, have been under the impression, after doing some research on the IRS uh, site, that some, uh, some income at the high end is legally tax-exempt, uh, about a million returns. And uh, that... That, that information then I, I was lost. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't replicate it. They, they apparently removed it or I dreamed it. I, I don't know. Anyway, uh, it, could you comment on whether there, that is in fact the case, that, that, uh, that there, there is a significant portion of the top 1% or even 0.1% of income earners in the United States who are tax exempt? And is the aggregate top 1% or 0.1% income actually known to the IRS, or is it available? And uh, Dr. Galbraith, uh, would these Thiel measurements that, that you have been employing, would, would, they, uh, would they accurately assess the magnitude of the top 1 and 0.1%? Thank you very much. So the answer to the second, last question is no, it's not a, not a tool aimed at that for that purpose. Uh, what, what we're doing is some a quite different exercise. But on the issue of taxing the uh, very top most incomes at some very high rate, uh, first of all, the point of the exercise cannot be to raise revenue for the government. The point of the exercise has to be to discourage entities from paying those incomes in the first place, right? which is what, why Roosevelt put in those taxes uh, in the early, in 1940, uh, at very high rates. It was to discourage companies from cre creating war millionaires. That was the point of it. Uh, would it work in the present world? I think it would not. I think when you move up to take a symbolic bite out of people at the very top, they all know where the Cayman Islands actually are. Right? That group of people is exactly the people whose incomes will escape. So I find this particular uh, exercise uh, in progressive self-congratulation uh, about going back to 1940s era tax rates to be frustrating. I don't think it's realistic, uh, and I don't think it's sensible. 
I, the estate tax is something you can do because you can appraise people's estates when they die. That's a definite <laughs> moment in time when most of their assets, and you can do it once, you don't have to do it every year. Piketty's capital levy that appraises everything every year is preposterous, but the estate tax is realistic. Uh, and I like the idea for if you want to make the tax code hit certain kinds of high incomes more effectively, my Texas law school colleague Calvin Johnson has something called the Shelf Project, which actually requires you to know something about the tax code and all of the little devices whereby people do exempt their income. And he has a lot of ways uh, to do that that don't, don't involve going back to very high marginal rates, but do involve uh, closing off the exclusions and exemptions that cause an unfair uh, advantage for wealthier taxpayers in the present code. So I think that's, uh, that is, I'm, I'm firmly with him on that, I think the, the, the realistic and practical way to go. Just say a couple of words about that. I mean, I, yeah. I'm with Jimmy on the estate tax, but I mean, the problem with the estate tax is the elimination or the gradual erosion of the estate tax is a very good example of what happens when the rich write the rules, right? So it's all very well to say it would be great and we're practical and we can do that, but that will require a political coalition that does not exist I, there, right there, now. I, I actually differ with you. I think a great many wealthy people in this country have bought into the idea that you accumulate for half your career and decumulate for the other half, which is why institutions like this one exist. Wouldn't be here otherwise. Institutions like mine in Texas exist for this reason. Well, they may buy so, into that, but they're not buying into the estate tax, right? Well, I, I, the estate tax survived because Bill Gates Sr. and a yeah. number of others, Chuck Collins, who, who had wealth, advocated for it. So I think actually there is uniquely in this country a, a, a political coalition that can, in fact, be built. Okay, but I mean, that. this is an example of that. I mean, not yeah. so much there on what we agree on, is that you have to build the political coalition that definitely so. um, to be able to make that happen. I agree absolutely. When I was a kid in, in Britain, um, the top rate on income, which was not all that high, was 97.5%. And of course, those very high rates went away, not because people thought they were unjust, but because, you know, not because they thought it was a good idea to lower taxes, mm -hmm. but because no one was actually paying taxes at that rate, because they know what the Cayman Islands is. But to take an, I don't know your example of the million people, but I mean, something like the carried interest deduction, for instance, in which people can convert income into something that looks like it's not income mm -hmm. and then hardly gets taxed is a very good example of the rich writing the rules. And if you look who's the great champion from that, it's not a Republican. Yeah, unfortunately, um, it's, my it's a Democrat. Um, and you know, the issue here is not so much right versus left, though there's a lot of that in here, but the, the Democratic public Party has moved along with the Republican Party so that there's just an enormous amount of people who are sympathetic to people with money. And uh, you know, if you run a political system on money, how else would it be? Um, so for that, you can be pretty cynical. But you know, there's a lot of people out here who are not rich and who can do something about this. And you know, you have to organize. I became a U.S. citizen when I realized what not voting was doing to inequality. And you know, when I went to my citizenship thing, this jerk got up from the INS or whatever it's now called and explained to us that voting was not important at all. I mean, which seemed just an outrageous thing for a member of the Government Nationalization Service to say. And, you know, one of the great forces of inequality has been the fact that such a huge fraction of the poor in this country cannot vote, either because they're in jail or because they're illegal or illegal immigrants. And so, you know, I'm not a poor person, but I was a legal immigrant and I had a green card and I got rid of it. And, you know, the, the validity of that reasoning was demonstrated to me on the first day I went to start applying because the INS, as it was then called, had been the bane of my existence for 25 years. They treated me like dirt. And going there was always one of the most unpleasant experiences of my life. As soon as I applied for citizenship, the lights came on. Dear Mr. Deaton, they kept appointments. It was just a completely different world. Voting matters. It matters by an incredible amount. And one of the things you can do is getting out the vote campaigns. Working on democracy with a small d is, I think, unbelievably important. I, I have one thing I, I neglected sure. to mention uh, in my talk, which is that uh, one of the last times that uh, Vasily Leontief and I appeared together was in the spring of 1985. And here we are, 
on the cover of Challenge magazine. That's him, of course, and I'm a minor figure with a little article. In there, but, uh, <laughs> uh, they, uh, I, I couldn't not, I couldn't so come here without bringing this particular memento. Good. Good. Well, I think we've ended on a great note. Uh, there is uh, dessert and coffee out on the mezzanine where you had lunch. And so let's uh, thank both of our, of our awards. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was good. Thank you very much.